A very good morning uh, yet again. Arnold Sagawa is my name. Uh, time to uh, delve into uh, some very, uh, should I say, erudite uh, conversations. Uh, tonight, uh, rather today, <laughs> morning, uh, we're going to uh, delve into uh, the agriculture conversation around uh, COVID-19. As uh, it is very clear, close to 70% uh, of our population is actually employed in the agriculture sector. Uh, but uh, how much is being done to make sure we do more value addition, arguably more uh, manufacturing, even industrialized agriculture? Uh, all these conversations, all these uh, points will be uh, uh, brought home by uh, my uh, very uh, established and uh, very colorful panel uh, today. I'm still stuck on tonight. Pardon me there. Um, uh, uh, joining me in the studio, I do have a Joanita Kamali uh, Babumba, who is a Deputy Director, Agriculture Credit Facility, ACF, at uh, the Bank of Uganda. Uh, many thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, joining us uh, remotely, we have uh, Simon Kaheru, Director, East Africa Business Council. Uh, Simon, thanks for uh, making time to speak to us and also uh, the Managing Director of Pearl Diary Farm, that's uh, Lato Milk, uh, Seth uh, Devendra, uh, gentlemen and uh, the lady, uh, thanks again. Uh, let's start with you, uh, Johnny, to, uh, here in the studio. Uh, earlier on, before we came on, I, uh, I was saying, uh, much as I like to think of myself as a monetarist, I, I was very oblivious to uh, Bank of Uganda having a, a very interesting uh, facility uh, in the agricultural space. Just uh, walk us through what this particularly is. What do you do? Right. Um, thank you very much. Arnold. Arnold. Um, it's a pleasure to come and um, talk to the public about uh, the agriculture credit facility mm. at the Bank of Uganda. It is a good scent to the farmers. So um, what I want to share this morning is what is this SCF, right? What are the terms and conditions we give to the farmers right. and agro-processors? What is the status quo during this COVID-19 pandemic? So um, what I want to start with is um, the, the, the background. This is a, uh, the agricultural credit facility, which was established in 2009 mm. by the government of Uganda in partnership with the participating financial institutions. It is a partnership. Yeah. Public-private partnership, PPP, yeah. and it is a risk-sharing facility. So these partners in this partnership, they include basically all the supervised financial institutions, supervised and regulated by the Bank of Uganda. You have in the, the tier ones, the commercial banks, you have in the tier twos the micro deposit taking institutions, mm. and then you have the credit institutions. Right. All right. Mm. And um, in addition, we have the Uganda Development Bank Limited in that partnership. UDB. The UDB. Mm. And um, Bank of Uganda, we are the administrators. You understand? Yeah. And uh, we report to the Ministry of Finance. And the operations of this agricultural credit facility, the SCF, they're governed by what we call the Memorandum of Agreement. Yep. It's been revised over the years, but currently it is MOA 2018. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the key objectives of this um, SCF? If I take you back to the agriculture experience, high mm -hmm. risk. We all know that. So the banks were apparently risk averse. Well, I think that Agriculture, uh, no, no go area. Mm. No go area. So the government came in play in this partnership and um, they decided to establish this mechanism to bridge the financing gap in agriculture. 
Uh, Jody, just uh, allow me to uh, put a pause there because yes. uh, uh, let's bring in our two guests, uh, particularly Simon. Uh, she's uh, Jody to here is hitting a very pertinent point, which is uh, the risk element. Now, on one end, the guarantor here, who can be the government in this case, the Bank of Uganda, comes in and says, "Guys, you know what? As uh, uh, financiers, uh, let's uh, have." a sort of uh, meet in the middle point where we can guarantee to some extent and uh, have the risk, the risk of this particular investment, which in this part is the sector, agriculture. Um, how is this faring, at least on the Afri uh, East African, uh, you're on the East African Business Council, how do you say this is panning out so far? Governments coming halfway and they try to de-risk the sector as a whole. Uh, thank you, Arnold, and uh, good morning, viewers. Good morning, Joanita and Seth. Um, Joanita uh, speaks very well about the agricultural credit facility, which, um, of course, came in very useful when it was initially launched in Uganda, at least. But looking at it from um, the overarching regional perspective, the risk mitigation, it ticks the box in terms of intent and, and, and even delivery to a certain extent. However, one of the discussion points around the SCA from uh, a business perspective, and business being not only agriculture, but pre-processing and processing down the line, is the linkage that ensures that that mis uh, risk mitigation is actually met. And uh, I'll give you an example. I know one, one business that um, took advantage of this facility to grow maize in northern Uganda many years ago, shortly after it was launched. And unfortunately, they got hit in a very big way because of weather. Now, weather was one thing they could uh, was one explain thing. that away and uh, utilize the insurance. But their onward contract with the, the, the organization they were supplying was severely affected. And their status was crushed after that. Why? Because the SEF, of course, targets development of uh, agricultural um, production commercial production and one of the things that we've been uh, speaking to especially financial institutions about is ensuring that that risk mitigation goes right down the line so that everybody who's relying on agricultural production should there be for instance uh, our current uh, conundrum global conundrum something like COVID-19 there should be there, we should enjoy a certain cushion that allows us all to shoulder this problem and find recovery out of it Right. Uh, th this, uh, you, you do raise some uh, interesting uh, cases here, some case studies. Uh, let, let me bring Seth in. Seth, uh, arguably, you're on the front line. Why do I say that? Because uh, you are an MD at a company that uh, made a final investment decision and said, you know what, we're going into Uganda, we're doing this regardless of what's being said or what's happening. Um, with this risk uh, 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 factor that uh, we're bringing to the core here, how much, uh, how much of uh, headwinds do you face with uh, the, the fact that there's not enough data, there's not enough statistics, well, uh, with the exception of BOU that's uh, working hand in hand with the, the statistics body, there's not enough stats that are coming out through the private sector to inform decisions like uh, Lato Milk hitting the market here or even investments being made? Yes, good morning, uh, Arnold. Uh, morning, Simon. Morning, Philip, uh, and all the viewers. It's a pleasure joining you today. And uh, uh, really, like uh, COVID-19 has played uh, a major uh, uh, role as a setback uh, to the industry. Uh, COVID, as you know, is a household name these days. And uh, the lessons we are getting from it is there are certain external uh, forces which can uh, actually like disturb uh, uh, the sector, yeah. any sector as such. We being in uh, the dairy sector under agriculture, uh, we are also facing the same issues. And uh, when it comes to agriculture uh, credit facilities as described by uh, Simon, like, uh, definitely the ground realities are a bit different uh, to it. <clears throat> uh, and access to the real farmer is still remote. There is a lot to be done there uh, so that individual farmer uh, can avail uh, the facilities and benefit from it. 
Johnny, let me bring you back in. Uh, access to the real farmer is yeah. uh, still a, a real challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, Tommy, how do you address this at a time where it was already tough before, mm -hmm. as uh, Seth is saying, yeah. <laughs> and now you have COVID-19 coming into the mix? Yes. Um, the truth of the matter is we have been giving out loans, mm. agriculture financing, at more concessionary terms to the farmers. How much are we talking? I'll tell you that the, 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 these concessionary terms and conditions, they entail one, the interest rates. Currently it is 12% uh, per annum or 1% per month. It is the cheapest on the market, even when you go in the microfinance institutions. This is uh, compounded on uh, what kind of basis? It is not compounded. Not compounded? No. My so word. it is 12% uh, moreover maximum. I, I need to get into farming. You are late, <laughs> but it's never too late. So <laughs> it is 12% maximum, but there are others who've actually gotten it at um, 8%, even 10%. Mm. Now, this money is the other concessionary term. is the long, long durations. Maximum is uh, eight years, maximum, including a grace period of up to three years. Right. Are we together? Yeah. Now. We also have a provision in the Memorandum of Agreement. We refer to it as the block allocation. This one is intended to unlock credit to small and micro borrowers, the small farmers they're talking about. Mm. This block allocation is to the participating financial institution up to about like 1.5 billion. But therein, the bank has put together small micro borrower applications of up to 20 million. In other words, a borrower can you know, access like even 1 million, we've given them, 5 million, 10 million, but not exceeding 20 million under the block allocation arrangement. Mm. And the beauty about this, the farmer is not expected to present traditional collateral, land requirements, and so on and so forth. We're talking about alternative methods of collateral. Mm. What is this? Character-based loans. I know Arnold here. He's in my neighborhood. <laughs> then at the same time, you have to have a viable project. We still go back to that basic uh. viable project. And this viable project has to have some cash flow analysis, are we together, mm. which demon demonstrates the capacity of the borrower to service the loan facility. It, it is commercial loans. These are commercial loans. I, I, so we, we go I, back I, to that basic, yes. Again, I, I hear you there. Uh, Simon, yes. you're, a, you're a communications guru. I, I, I really want you to come in here. Do you get the sense that uh, people know what such opportunities like what Joanita here is explaining. Do you get the sense that people know, oh, there's such a gap? I mean, even I am thrilled. I think I'm in the wrong business out here wearing ties. I know you, you are in the wrong business. Indeed, you should join farming. I can tell you right now. <laughs> but I, I, I'll tell you that I'm also um, happy to hear what Joanita is talking about here. And one of the questions I asked myself as she was speaking is, was the, the one million she mentioned, is that U.S. dollars or <laughs> Uganda shillings? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you see, it, it goes back to what you're saying uh, regarding communication. A lot of what we hear from uh, the government of Uganda, the Bank of Uganda, is U.S. dollars. When we talk about things like the agricultural credit fund, uh, credit facility, it's normally U.S. dollars. The banks talk to business in U.S. dollars. And... This is one of the, the, the problems that creates that gap in reaching the rural farmer, as Seth said, right? And, and I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you right now that the government keeps on talking about this policy of uh, nationalizing our uh, financial uh, terms and financial systems, but it's not actually being done on the ground, and we need to begin enforcing it. I'll also give you an example that, um, that, that, that uh, makes me speak about the need to create a linkage across the businesses and across East Africa. I also work at um, a bottler here in Uganda, Coca-Cola. We, we developed a preprocessor who went to the agricultural credit facility to get money 
to set up a plant so that we could receive mangoes from northern Uganda. The project gave him a contract of $2 million. Okay? This uh, organization went and actually purchased a plant, began establishing it, and recruited 20,000 farmers to provide these mangoes. Where, where did the shortfalls come about? Number one, the laws of the land. They were being interpreted in a manner that did not encourage that local produce to be factored in for zero excise. But number two, the quality of mangoes the farmers were supposed to supply needed a certain amount of investment, which the preprocessor could not put in and was not accounted for or provided for in the, by the SEF. Now, if all that had been tied in as necessary from ground all the way to our production for export, because we would have been exporting the, the juice period and even the finished juice, right. Kenya would have benefited from logistics, all our farmers would have benefited from production, more processors would have been able to come up and get mangoes from there, which would generally spur the economy. And that, like I said, was the intent of the SEF. But the implementation, once it goes through commercial banks, and is not communicated and, and uh, carried through the way it was supposed to, it dies along the way and stays at a certain level that Seth has pointed out causes that failure to trickle down and create the benefits. Uh, so Simon, you've uh, addressed some uh, uh, heavy points there. I I'm going to let Joanita uh, uh, respond to uh, some of the, the, the government issues, maybe some of the facility issues, especially guaranteeing and, and going forth. But uh, I want to bring Seth in uh, just before I, I, I throw this over to Joanita. Seth, you're, yeah. uh, you arguably have the, the poster child of uh, what good can come from uh, this kind of uh, investment. I don't want to call it uh, 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 an angel kind of investing that goes very, very broad. You go, you set up in a region that is heavy on uh, milk uh, uh, in, in liters or gallons. Uh, you, you, you hate hard. Uh, God knows you have some coolers in the region. And now you're talking about exporting to uh, not just Uganda, rather, uh, for local produce, but exporting regionally. How did you address this? Because Simon, on the other hand, is, uh, is mentioning some, some shortfalls, right, firsthand. He's not hearing it from people. Yeah. How did you address some of these things that uh, Simon is uh, actually bringing to the table? Yeah, as I said, that uh, the dairy sector uh, uh, has been hit uh, uh, hardly, uh, very hard, in fact, and uh, uh, we are trying to salvage. In fact, uh, even before the uh, COVID-19 issues, which came up in the lockdown, uh, there were regional uh, uh, miscommunications, uh, particularly uh, within the EAC, uh, there were certain uh, trade barriers uh, for the milk from Uganda. And not only Pearl Dairy, many other uh, processes uh, in Uganda were affected. And uh, we were unable to export uh, our products to particularly Kenya, who imposed uh, this blockade on us. So like uh, what, what I mean to say is that uh, the effect is still there. Uh, uh, last three months, like I would say like uh, till uh, end of 2019, that is the whole year, we had purchased almost 143 million liters of milk during that year. And uh, this year, uh, and this year, like First quarter, we have only bought uh, 15 million liters. We think that we'll be falling short of uh, uh, procurement uh, because we don't have a market as of now. Kenya being one of the biggest market in uh, EAC community. Uh, we, we don't uh, uh, have market there. We were exporting almost uh, 80% of our produce to different countries uh, and majorly to Kenya uh, under ESC. So what we feel that uh, if uh, the ESC members can uh, sit together, resolve the issues, and we restart uh, exporting our products from Uganda to Kenya and other ESC countries, it's going to benefit uh, the uh, ground level farmers. Today, the farmer is uh, 
under uh, deep pressure, the prices of milk have gone down. Uh, they went as low as 200 shillings uh, farm gate prices uh, in March. So even the farmer is unable to uh, recover its cost of production. So there, these are the issues uh, which we need to sit together. And on top of it, uh, the COVID has added to it. The uh, local market, the sales have gone down. The export markets, the sales have gone down. Uh, we don't have access to uh, overseas market uh, because of the lockdowns. There are no buyers who are interested uh, in getting our products. Right. This is on the dairy farmer's side. Like, like. Additionally, what I like to say is that uh, it's not only the uh, the production of the farmers and uh, the processors which have been affected, even the employment. Now, employment, like uh, I would say that uh, if I talk about pearl dairy itself. Uh, we had over 2,000 2, employees with us uh, end of 2019. Today, we are working with only 300. Right. Balance uh, of the workers have been laid off. And uh, they don't have employment. Like We don't have a market. We are not buying milk because uh, we buy whatever we can sell within Uganda right. or some uh, small uh, exports here and there. Yeah. Uh, so, so it has uh, a big effect. Seth, just uh, just allow me to uh, uh, stop you there because uh, you're getting into yeah. the trade issue that I wanted to address in the second half uh, of this particular yeah. discussion. Um, uh, John, it, uh, let me just let you uh, address uh, the issue that uh, Simon just raised earlier on. Mm -hmm. um, it's one thing to say these things on paper, you know, and uh, it's another for them to uh, uh, just go up on the cupboard and uh, collect a lot of dust. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there's a lot of guys like Seth out there, uh, sorry, uh, Simon out there, uh, who might want to start something away from a big bottler like Coca-Cola, but the legislation in practice is just hindering everything. All the good work that, let's say, the SEF has out there is being hindered by uh, what's actually on the ground. Uh, how do you address some of the issues that uh, Simon does raise? Okay. Um, um, I want to uh, assure Simon that... Um, we actually don't have any major hindrance. Because like I mentioned earlier, our operations are governed by the memorandum of agreement. Currently it's 2018. And with those terms and conditions therein, SF is actually performing. It is not just on paper. It is not hearsay. It is a reality. It came into play with the main objective, okay, to commercialize, mechanize, and modernize the agricultural sector in the country. But when we say uh, commercialize, uh, when hoes are still being passed out uh, <laughs> on the eve of an election year, that, that defeats my logic because I don't know how we're mechanizing a sector that is employing 70% of, of, the, of the population and we're still going for hoes. I don't give out holes. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe somebody else is in that business of giving <laughs> out holes. <laughs> I go into mechanization well, because well, that, that was uh, the heart, that was the entire purpose right. for the establishment of the SEF. Modernize, mechanize, and commercialize agriculture. We are talking about giving out medium to long term loans, okay, mm. to all projects engaged in primary agriculture, agro-processing for value addition, and the green trade. I heard Simon talk about value addition. Yes. Simon funds are available for you to come and access, you know, whatever funding, how I don't know how much you're looking for, to engage into your value addition projects. It is happening. Actually, now our problem is inadequate capitalization, but I'll come to that later. So I just want to inform Simon that uh, it's good to, to, I would really want to encourage prospective potential borrowers with viable projects to approach their bankers and request for the agricultural credit facility loan financing. To date, by, our, by December 2019, 
we had given out 408 billion Uganda shillings, these loans are denominated in Uganda shillings, not dollars, Simon. We don't give out dollars. They're denominated in Uganda shillings because the amortization schedules, we work them out, we calculate them <laughs> basing on shilling <laughs> denomination, not <laughs> dollar, Simon. I want to really allay your fear. Uh, so we've given out 408 billion, and government of Uganda has contributed 207 billion. Right. So, so and we, we are happening. We've given to about like 668 projects, but therein uh. we have large aggregators. Apparently, Pearl Dairy is one of our cases. You understand? Oh. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know. So we have given out and, uh, uh, to about 668 applicants, you understand. But therein we have the large aggregators who have um, outgrower schemes, which cater for tens of thousands of There's small... There's a trickle-down effect. There is a yes, trickle-down, yes, yes. yes. So there are all the small borrowers engaged in the outgrowers, outgrower scheme for the large aggregator. But uh, so uh, b before I bring Simon back in, maybe in uh, just one sentence, you can uh, uh, just address the issue of if, if you're giving out such huge uh, uh, funds, chunks of funds in a good way, I, I, I'm very, it's very commendable. So why does uh, BOU need any uh, recapitalization to start with? If, you're, if you do ask for $500 billion to recapitalize, why, uh, why do you need that if uh, you're giving out such the, the loan scheme is just amazing. It's over 400 billion, like you mentioned. Why would in the, the PP approach? Yes, but government has put in 207 billion. No, no, actually, the government has put in 141 billion since inception. Mm. But the disbursement between the 141 billion and the 207 okay, that, creates that difference yeah. Yeah. comes in from the reflows, the repayments. Right. So, whatever we get back, we on land to ah. other viable enterprises. I see that, I see that. Yeah. Yeah. Simon, uh, I think uh, Joanita here has uh, addressed all your issues. I saw you nodding there and giving her a thumbs up. Are, uh, are you about to ask for a facility <laughs> yourself? With you, Joanita. Uh, this is Ambassador Ibro. Can I speak? Yes, I have a problem with my, my camera, so I would like to speak without my... Right. Uh, I think uh, we might be uh, having a, a technical glitch, but uh, let's uh, run off for a short break. We'll be back uh, with the conversation. Uh, more parties uh, will be joining us. Uh, it is definitely getting heated. You can join the conversation again on social media at NTV Uganda. That's on Twitter and uh, Facebook, but uh, let's take a quick break. We'll be back with uh, more NTV at... Morning at NTV. Uh, it's exactly uh, 16 minutes past uh, 8 o'clock. I'm Arnold Sagawa. This is uh, Morning at NTV. Time to uh, head on to the streets. Uh, very on uh, Stephen Bide, uh, our very uh, vibrant reporter, is uh, on the streets to uh, just get the views of uh, the farmers out there. It's only fair to uh, bring them into the conversation if we're talking agriculture. It would be very unfair to uh, just uh, leave it to the studio. Midday, how are you doing? Good morning, Arnold Segawa, and you who is watching Morning at NTV. Stephen Imbidon, Fefe Siwe Chibuka, right here in Nansana. This is Hoima Road, uh, this place being Nansana. I'm just standing opposite the Church of Uganda and the Naweru Road that uh, links people coming from off Hoima Road towards Waise and the other areas uh, through Katoke and Naweru. This is Morning at NTV. I'm going to be speaking to the people here just at the market that is opposite the church. Let me know about the effect of COVID-19 on the market prices of our goods as well as the demand of people who are buying uh, vegetables foodstuffs from this market that is just opposite the Church of Uganda market. As you enter this place, you will see that as you are branch off the road, uh, there is uh, some vendors who are applying their trade on the outskirts of the market here as you enter the central market. But as well, there is a checkpoint here uh, for those who have to enter the market, but have first either wash their hands here from this place and then also have uh, their temperature measured here uh, from uh, these people of Uganda Red Cross Society as we enter this market. I've already uh, taken my measurements and I'll be straight go, go, heading to uh, the market to speak to these uh, vendors here who are selling different foodstuffs like matoke, uh, Irish potatoes, uh, uh, sweet potatoes, as well as cassava and other vegetables here in the market. They'll be letting me know about what's happening in this market and how the effect of this uh, COVID-19 on the market uh, prices. Let me begin with this gentleman here on 
here in the market was sort of civil. Sente Katie <laughs> Okay, Justin. Bacasumatuvalas. <laughs> She's saying that uh, because of the condition that people are not working, they uh, have to, she has, to, has maintained the prices of her, her sweet potatoes and they are, she's still selling it at the same price as uh, 2,000, 1,000 uh, per, per everyone who is buying uh, the, the sweet potatoes from that place. She's saying that she's not having any effect in terms of uh, uh, increasing her input there. I can see some social distancing here. space of Katimbulira akuba tu afuno bradde mbera chi chu sewo mu kunsubula ne mu guza abantu bajja batia ne beye li etia akuba tu afuno bradde bo mbera nti ukide buvinyo ate rwachi ebintu enali nsubula ati sibi ebili ku mudala kuliko butono e gamba na ne ba customer te bashala bitu ati awe mbera te tumaije tulaga aba mibali waka we value what we am, but we are not afraid to be At the end of the day, we are not going to be afraid. We are 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 going to be to Ebimu so what I'll cover sim laying and net transport umbalamgo in no good at your food. Basically she's saying that the effect of uh, the lockdown on transport of the ban on public transport is affecting her business here because she cannot freely move from one place of uh, at least from the, her place of this market to where she was purchasing her commodities from. Nanya Kumanya uh in Songa Yokwanga in Bedin Edi War. Chicho Channel Chicole Wokwanga uh in
tutambuze bino bya mwenga bulijjo nadaya kubya bay yebintu batemu ku taxi wangi batemu ku taxi awe batamu ku taxi awe mili muziso wolo kudamu ne jitambula runs ade tuchi aka abanyonga kati kati tusemba yo nya kumanya e bay wino walingo lenge nyanyo otia kati kugeza nga kali akatasa walinga tunafuna bulwadde wali kali ka sente mmeka na kati ka sente mmeka Alinka tunda kumutuwa unaika tige mtu soba mwa kasambu, kanana. Okay. okay, thank you so much. Uwe bali nyamanyo mbami yaani? Naka oya Suzani. Uwe bali nyamanyo naka oya Suzani. Uh, the lady says, before the COVID-19 disease, uh, she was uh, saying that uh, that benzene uh, of uh, tomatoes at 10,000 shillings, but now she's selling it at just 7,000 shillings. That is a difference of uh, 3,000 shillings that uh, the fall in prices. This is morning at 10 TV, Stephen in Bidon, Fefe Suwe Chibuga, Mbadde Nava Chara, Nava Suguzi, Wamu, Nava Kula Mkatali, Kana Kenansana. I've been speaking to them about the effect of COVID-19 on the agricultural produce, the, the changes in demand, as well as uh, their, the supply. What effect is it on their income and for those who are purchasing? This is Morning and Ten TV taking a bike to studios for Arnold Segawa, who is there in the studios. Mova. Bide, uh, many thanks for that. Uh, I, I, I wish uh, we could uh, have more time. We could have actually delved into some more issues. Uh, but uh, join it, uh, bringing you back uh, into the conversation. You've heard from uh, what's happening on the streets. Let's talk about uh, loan defaulting and maybe restructuring, given the fact that now we have a pandemic on our hands. Uh, word is uh, uh, we might be seeing non-performing loans uh, coming from what? Uh, 4.7 to about 5.9. Some are even... Uh, saying it might be doomsday and uh, fess it up to a uh, 7%. Just uh, touch this briefly, then uh, we cross over. Um, thank you very much, um, Arnold. I think we've had a scenario on the, in Nasana. Mm. Now, that cuts across the country. COVID-19 impact to farmers is real. Mm. It is real. It has disrupted the market linkages. Production is still going on. Access to the, the SEF has still been happening. Mm. So production has been going on. But while the production is going on, there's a hindrance in the market linkages. Due to the measures that have been um, the presidential directed, directives, yes, yes, under the presidential directives, you had the lady Nansana. Taxis. Taxis, as in the transportation, has been disrupted. Mm. So how will she get her produce from the village to the market? Yes, I know there are some transportation trucks and all that that you know, are ferrying uh, uh, a produce to the market, but it is not in the volumes that used to happen in a pre-COVID-19 period. Yeah. Now, with this disruption in the market linkages, you had the lady, she was selling her tomatoes. She, she said, I think it was 10,000. 10, now it has come down to 7,000. Mm. So you can see the prices are going down. You had the gentleman from Paul Darius. He can't export anymore. Mm. So what happens? They don't have that sufficient, adequate cash generation to service the loan facilities. Definitely. So you Cash find flows, yeah. that you find that the COVID nineteen has actually impaired the ability of uh, farmer borrowers mm. to service their debt obligations sufficiently, and apparently this is a threat to the stability of the financial sector. Mm. Now, Bank of Uganda had to come in, and I think you are all aware of the uh, the guidelines that were actually um, circulated yeah. to all the participating financial institutions. That was on the 14th of April, 2020. BOU issued the guidelines on credit relief and loan restructuring measures to the supervised financial institutions during the COVID-19 pandemic with effect from 1st April 2020 for 12 months until uh, 31st March 2021. 
a period of 12 months. Mm -hmm. So the measures have already been um, circulated to the, uh, the banks that are participating even under the SCF. And um, what are some of these measures? I won't go into the details because I would want to um, encourage potential borrowers to actually go to your bankers. Uh, these, these measures are for your benefit. Uh, and Mr. And Paul Diary, these measures are for your benefit. And they include repayment moratorium and ad adjustments in repayment schedules. Right, right. Uh, uh, d definitely, I, I hear you when you mention yes. some of these things. Definitely yes. the relief. Mm. Uh, mm. Simon, uh, uh, is uh, John Ito preaching to the choir? Uh, are you <laughs> sold with uh, what BOU had to uh, put forth? Uh, let alone, you've heard from uh, what's happening in Nansana. Mm -hmm. Do you get the sense that uh, the business side, the, the, the ordinary folk, the 60% that's in the informal sector, uh, are they sold? Uh, Arnold, uh, Joanita makes very good points, no question about it, and she's um, absolutely correct about um, the measures, for instance, that BOU has introduced to make life easier for a certain level of the economy, no question. But as you've heard from the people in the marketplace, there are issues, and the expectation is business will be difficult, whether it's for the market lady in Nanzana or for um, myself providing beverages, even though we're essential services, or for Seth and his farmers. This is what COVID-19 has done. What we need, however, is, is that coordination, especially within the region now. And the president said it very well last night when he said there are certain things that we should not, um, we should not take for granted or compromise on. One, farms. He called them the pillars of our survival. Farms, factories, essential services. Now, those three have those other linkages, such as cargo truck drivers, which is what he was focusing on last night. Those uh, market ladies in Nansana, for instance, we all know that Uganda produces more food and has the, the capacity to produce enough food for the whole of East Africa. If during this COVID-19 crisis, we looked at our uh, 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 competitive advantages as the individual countries and ensured that we build them so that each, econ each bit of the economy thrives, that lady in Nansana would be taken advantage of all the food that comes to her and the logistical system that operates so that this food that she's selling now to people like you and I instead goes across the region, okay? Because there are countries in this region where they don't have that food now. And that means that, for instance, a facility like, not the SEF, but another banking facility would now focus more on building logistics. The president yesterday spoke about uh, the, the need for a rail uh, service across East Africa in order to decrease transportation of COVID across the border. That's where money needs to be focused immediately so that we can have these three pillars operating. Air transport across these regions. Again, that was one of the, the cargo transportation elements the president said would be much more useful. As the East African Business Council for the last 15 years plus, 22 years actually, We've been talking about the need to remove all air travel restrictions, especially for cargo in East Africa. We shouldn't have to spend so much transporting cargo across these five countries here. But right now we do. And today we realize how we have not been clever. I'm not putting it polite for 22 years. So we now have the opportunity to jumpstart those elements of the economy that will actually benefit business from top all the way down to that leading answer. And, and BOU, please, let's look at doing that urgently, very, very urgently. It's, it's what our survival depends on as a region. Uh, let's bring Seth in. Uh, basic economics would uh, dictate, well, uh, words like arbitrage are thrown around very often, and uh, it might explain why you actually set up plant in uh, Marara as opposed to setting up in Kampala. Um, with the pandemic that we're facing right now, is this a wake-up call to concentrate on the logistical shortfalls that we have been having as uh, Joe Anita, as uh, uh, Simon have alluded to? And if so, how can this be addressed? Yes, uh, John and Simon has been right uh, in this direction. Like logistics uh, plays a major role in, in any industry or in any economy. And, uh, and we need to look into it. Uh, 
Barara being at a remote, remote location uh, from the main town or the border, particularly the Kenyan border, uh, it makes more important that uh, how we can get the trucks, the logistics uh, to Barara and then to different parts, uh, even like reaching Mombasa, you know, like it's a long way from here. Right, uh, Jonita, let's uh, talk on to uh, some maybe more uh, different issues that uh, have come to the core. Um, something that uh, the lady was alluding to earlier on. Mm. Th there's, uh, I always allude to the fact that uh, the time to fix a leaking roof is uh, when the sun is shining. Mm. You know, uh, now would be a good time to actually address uh, some of the issues that we have seen come to the front. Uh, the, our logistical problems have come to the front. Uh, yesterday there was a story about uh, time to actually bring back ca cargo trains. You know, now is when we realize that we might actually need cargo trains. Um, right now, policy-wise, you are at the helm of the, the heart of policy in uh, the financial space in the country. Right now, what do you see that BOU can address in the near term, given the COVID-19 pandemic and what it has actually showed us? Right. Um, thank you very much, um, Arnold. And thank you, Simon and uh, the MD of Pal Dairy. Um, I think we need to think about these issues holistically. Bank of Uganda is no Mr. Fix It All. No. We need to come into play in a holistic approach. And I want to focus on agriculture, commercialization, modernization of agriculture. I think we need to look at the, <coughs> we need to look at the um, support to agriculture, looking at the entire value chain, looking at the entire agriculture value chain, providing support to the farmer right from that cons when they conceive the idea mm. simon is over there he has conceived the idea and he wants to go into agro processing i don't know exactly in which area but assuming it is um, maize milling mm -hmm. okay or processing of milk like paul is doing so i think the farmer has to be given some amount of support in terms of capacity building into that venture you're going into. Do you understand it or you're just excited? You know Ugandans, they, they're not really... Um, Let's grow vanilla. And yeah, everyone gets somebody starts vanilla and then everybody <laughs> jumps on board. <laughs> so we are saying, no, understand what you're going into. Uh. So you need to help this farmer build their capacity. And we have institutions in place. A good one. We've got the narrows, we've got narrow especially. I want to speak for narrow. Mm. They do a lot of capacity building in the different enterprises. If you're going into poultry, because we've had some workshops partnering with narrow, and there's even another program, Seeds of Gold Farm Clinics. Yes, so that's, uh, by, that's in daily monitor. Yes. Exactly, yes. Of, of course, that's ours. Now, yes, this really. is a, a package that looks at the farmer from the beginning, okay? Mm -hmm. You package them, you give them the information, the, the technical skilling mm -hmm. about that enterprise you want to engage in. Now from that point, you engage maybe extension services. Don't leave the farmer to do it alone. And we've got the services decentralized actually, countrywide. One thing having them decentralized, another thing about the performance, that is not for me to judge. Mm. So, you look at the farmer from the farm, provide the extension services, yeah. provide them with all the necessary information required to ensure and the support, the farm in inputs. Give them the farm inputs, you understand. Yeah. And then they go into their production. Now once they go into their production, Somebody out there is assisting them with the prices, whether it is local, whether it is in regional, or whether it is international. Right, right. So that the farm is not just growing this venture, is not into this venture in vain. 
I, I, I have expectation. I'm expecting this amount of money. Mm. Somebody has already worked it out for them. And then at the end of the day, the farmer is being supported to take the produce to the market. That's where the market linkages come into play. John, it, uh, it, it has to be a coordinated approach. I, I see All what the you way mean, up yeah. from the farm to the plate. Right. Yeah. Uh, some parting remarks, uh, Seth and Simon, uh, still also join it. I'm going to ask you, uh, th this is the last question. I ask it mm -hmm. for uh, each and every one. The reason why I say this is because uh, the average age, the, uh, the reason for this question is because the average age of a, an African, in, a sub-Saharan African is uh, 19.4 years. Uh, and uh, the question is, Simon, Seth, uh, also join it, how do we make agriculture sexy? Uh, Simon, you go first. Very, very briefly before we uh, part off. Very briefly, um, just like you yourself over there decided, wow, I need to go into agriculture. Yeah. Show where the benefits are, make sure it goes technological, and then communicate it right. You know, that, that, that age group you're talking about is this age group that has a very, very short attention span. They are, they are on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. Their minds are not this small, but that's how much attention they pay. So for them to go and find out information about the agricultural credit facility, for instance, put it in bite-sized pieces in the places where they go to. Every time they go to YouTube, they go to Snapchat, Instagram, put agriculture there and show them not just success stories, but how they can achieve that success. And, and very, very importantly, show them the wider perspective. Let's not talk about only what we have in Bukoman, Sindhi, Lansana, or Uganda. Let's show them the entire region. Because these people spend a lot of their time consuming things from outside of these border territories here. They are online and they are very, very open-minded. So let's, let's go to where they are and give it to them the way they, they really need to get it so that we activate them into this economy, the agricultural economy, all this stuff. Simon, uh, I, I think I would end up put it better. Uh, Seth, uh, how do we make agriculture sexy? Yeah. Uh, like uh, uh, what we are doing, like skill development of the farmers is also very important. Like uh, as uh, Simon and uh, John has been telling, like, uh, we are engaged actively with a uh, lot of farmers uh, for last two years. And uh, we have been uh, uh, engaging the farmers uh, in terms of uh, animal health, uh, farm management, and uh, also like uh, taking dairy as a business. So the skill development of the farmers is important. We also try to engage the farmers or link the farmers with a lot of financial institutions so they can uh, uh, have access to credits. We also try to uh, organize for them uh, uh, certain uh, subsidies uh, so that the interest rates uh, can go down further uh, and the farmer is not under pressure too much uh, on the finance side. Uh, despite all this, there is a lot to be done in terms of uh, extension services and uh, particularly like uh, everything goes for a toss uh, when uh, the farmer doesn't guess the cost of his own production, what is, has been happening for the last three months. And uh, we all need to sit together and see how this can be addressed. Juanita, I think uh, you have the final shot. Uh, okay. uh, Simon has uh, said some uh, very interesting stuff. You need to uh, uh, find a way to address uh, many of these issues in uh, a spectrum that uh, right. uh, there's uh, a very, uh, youth, the very youthful population actually does grasp. Uh, I, I don't know what you have to say to that. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Arnold and um, Seth my and other Simon, colleagues, yeah. uh, um, especially Simon. Simon, you, 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 I can see your concern about the, um, the awareness. Is the public aware about this um, SEF? Uh, to a large extent, we have tried to undertake um, marketing, publicity, sensitization, creating awareness about the availability of the agricultural credit facility and how a farmer can access the loans and the terms and conditions governing. So we have tried to traverse the country. Actually, we got funding from the Ministry of Finance to carry out the publicity. Yeah. So we tried to traverse uh, a large part of the country. I can't say that we have completed the entire country, right? 
<coughs> but um, um, we, we have tried to traverse the country. And uh, this very year, 2020, we had a huge program to just focus on northern Uganda and eastern Uganda using uh, a, a, a publicity consultant firm, you know, appointed, you know, um, recruited by Bank of Uganda just to engage into mass sensitization uh, to, you know, to, to, to the farmers in northern and eastern Uganda. So sensitization has been happening and it is still continuing. What closed us off is the COVID. But come post-COVID, we shall jump into there and we shall partner. We have our partners in uh, northern and eastern Uganda and uh, we have this uh, professional publicity firm that is going to be helping us so that farmers learn more about the SEA and how they can access. And I want to encourage the potential borrowers out there, please come for these monies. Because basically what happens is um, for any loan that is submitted through a commercial bank, it is a 50-50 risk sharing. Yeah. You understand? The bank, will, the PFI will put in 50%. Government will put in 50%. Now, for a is loan... Is there a threshold for if you're borrowing this much and above? Not at all. It cuts across whether it is the small micro borrowers like I talked about <laughs> or the large. Because we cater for small, micro, medium, and then large borrowers. Now, for any loan that is submitted through uh, the micro deposit taking institutions and credit institutions, hear this. A loan to the sub-borrower, the risk sharing is the bank will just put in 30%. The commercial bank? Government, mm. no, 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 the tier two. Oh. The MDIs and the credit institutions. Yeah. For the loan to the sub-borrower through those institutions tier two, um, the bank will, th they will put in 30%. Uh, mm. And the government of Uganda, Bank of Uganda will put in 70%. This is actually to encourage on lending, long-term lending, medium to long-term, to the agriculture sector in order to boost agriculture production, commercialization in this country. Agriculture is our mainstay. You had the president emphasize last night that you can forget about everything, but not agriculture, <laughs> especially when you're looking at food security. And Uganda's, Uganda is a potential food basket in the region and in the world out there. Uh, you Thank know you what, uh, John, it, uh, uh, I'm on the financing side, it is extremely impressive. You guys are going over and above to make yes. sure the credit is uh, forwarded to, uh, uh, to the farmers. But my issue is things like uh, uh, the policy side, you know, uh, let's say taxation on uh, irrigation material, you know, how about that is scrapped? Yeah. Uh, legislation, if someone is bringing in uh, uh, tractors, okay, I know for a fact tractors and the heavy machinery, uh, combine harvesters, that might be exempt. But irrigation, we're looking at what? 4% of uh, Uganda's arable land is what is irrigated. Yeah. You know, so uh, policy-wise, mm. like you said, this is holistic. You can't just yes. look at one thing and say, so how do we address, how do we fought, uh, push the conversation in that direction with a more faceted, uh, pronged approach? Not right. saying, you know what, this year we're addressing this. Mm -hmm. Next year we're addressing communication. Yes. How do we have that public discourse, you know, mm -hmm. that hol holistic discourse and move this forward, away from uh, chats like this. Right. Um, apparently, there is a, a, a committee that is looking into the agriculture finance policy. Mm. It is still a work in progress. Mm. It's a committee focusing on the uh, crafting of the agriculture finance policy. And it is comprised of various professionals in the agriculture spectrum. Now, one of the issues is to look at the, the issues of taxation, tax exemption on agriculture, you know, um, uh, machinery. Uh, there are issues to do with agriculture insurance mm. for risk mitigation in agriculture. And there are issues of looking at the um, agriculture financing, looking at the holistic approach. Because if you look at Bank of Uganda, we are just into um, agricultural credit as mm. far as the SAP is concerned. But what about the other 
aspects, the logistics, the market linkages, and then the financing. So this committee, I think you need to give them just a little bit of time, and then they're going to come out, and I'm sure they will um, hold conversations about this policy and how it's going to benefit the Ugandans, especially those engaged in agriculture uh, in this country. Joanita, Thank many thanks for uh, making time to speak to us and uh, our other esteemed panelists. Uh, in the studio, we had uh, Joanita Kamaliva uh, Bab Babumba, who is a Deputy Director, Agriculture Credit Facility at uh, the Bank of Uganda. Uh, joining us from Barara, the Managing Director of uh, Pearl, uh, that's uh, Seth uh, Devendra and uh, Simon uh, Kaheru, uh, who is with the East Africa Business Council. That's where we leave it for today's edition of Morning at NTV. Arnold Sagawa is my name. In just uh, about four hours, I'll be back with uh, NTV at one. For now, I'm off for coffee and uh, pondering my life decisions and uh, walking into agriculture, as I've been convinced by my panelists. Have a good morning.